Let us take a moment and pray silently for the outpouring of the Spirit of God. Lord Jesus, everything I am about to say this morning is 100% useless and irrelevant unless you fill us with your spirit. No matter how correct or true, Lord, what I or any other preacher or any other Christian says, Lord, it is all so much hot air unless the breath of your spirit fills us. We plead for the outpouring of your former and latter rains, Lord. Pour out your spirit upon us. We need you. We cannot succeed without you. We cannot know you without your spirit. Please fill us. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome to part five of How to Walk on Water. Subtitled The Adventist Advantage. Let's see, I think I may have just a few here. That's all right. I have just a few, so yes, don't sell them. Just, just cast them out. That's right. Let me do a brief review with you, if I could, of where we have been thus far. How to walk on water. How to be this normal church, supernaturally endowed, spirit-filled, where incredible things take place on a regular basis and where lives are transformed frequently. This is what it means to be a church that walks on water. How do you do that? Number one, we've talked about seeking the former and latter reign of the Spirit. What we just did briefly, what I pray that you're doing each day, asking God to send his Spirit, not just on yourself, but on all those that call his name. This is absolutely foundational to finishing the work of Christ. Everything else is just so much hot air, unless the Spirit of God is in control. Number two, Make a decision to personally pursue genuine, mature discipleship. We've talked about this at length, what it means to be a genuine, mature disciple. It cannot be something that just somebody up front or somebody in the class says we should do. It must be something that you say that I will do personally. And thirdly, as a church, pursue the unified, organized discipleship of others. This is working as a team. This is like we talked about, Philippians chapter 1, verses 27 and 28. Moving out, not only personally to become a genuine, mature disciple, but to help those around us and those outside of the church also become a genuine, mature disciple of Jesus Christ. Now this calls for at least a solidly biblical church structure that fully embraces the priesthood of all believers. This is what we talked about last week. This idea that in the Bible we are all ministers. In the New Testament order of things, at least in the Old Testament, it was not always that way. But in the New Testament, we are now a nation of priests. What the Old Testament dreamed about comes to reality. And all those who call on the name of Christ, they are ministers in his church. We looked at the biblical role of a pastor. We discovered that being a TSP, typical settled pastor, which is what I am, is not found in the New Testament. That role is not found there, but local elders are referred to as pastors, and everyone is a minister. A church structure must recognize that fact and become structured in that fashion if it is to become a church that walks on water. Now, we left us last time with an unanswered question. The question was, what am I doing here? If I'm a TSP, if I'm a typical subtle pastor and I'm not mentioned in Scripture, then what on earth am I doing here? I want to answer that question today, at least begin to. And I want to do that by answering another question. What would a church that has a New Testament structure look like? All the stuff that we've been talking about thus far, particularly last week, if there was a church that did that, that took it seriously, this, this New Testament organization that God, what would it look like? What might it look like right here? Well, let's do a little searching. 
You can turn your piece of paper over now if you'd like to. I appreciate your diligence and honesty in resisting the temptation uh, to turn over uh, that paper. I'm glad you've done it this time. I'm going to do something today that I do not normally do. Very rare. Normally, I preach a sermon to you. Today, we're going to read it together. And there's a reason for that. Because what I'm going to talk to you about today is so potentially invigorating and inspiring, so positive, that you need to see it with your own two eyes, not just hear it with your own two ears. I want you to see the things that are in this sheet. No fair reading ahead. Those of you whose heads are down, so da, da, back up here. Come on, come on, stick with me. Don't read ahead. The things we're going to look at on this piece of paper, some of them we're going to skip. I'm anticipating that you will go back and read them yourself later on, okay? Check it out. Check me out what I'm saying here. Is it, re is it reality, okay? Don't just take my word for it. We're going to go through, through some things here that if you've never heard them before, uh, I think you're going to like it. I think you're going to like it. And I'll preface it by saying that last week we looked at God's kingdom structure in the Old Testament. Then we looked at his kingdom structure in the New Testament. And now it's time to take a peek at God's kingdom structure in the Seventh-day Adventist church. Take a look here. Roman numeral number one, the incredible Adventist movement. For the first 60 to 70 years of Adventism's history, with few exceptions, we Seventh-day Adventists were on fire for God. We were truly a movement. A new and final step in God's redemptive plan lodged firmly in our first love experience. The Spirit was at work. Sacrifice for the cause of Christ was the norm. People met Jesus or sunk their roots deeper into him on a regular basis. There was a sense of mission and drive and passion that makes the sometimes dormant nature of today's North American church seem like a different universe. While our pioneers certainly had their problems and at times glaring ones, 1888 comes to mind, by and large, the place was hopping in their day, and the back door on most churches was firmly shut and locked. Do you understand the symbolism there? The back door meaning that a member would come into the Adventist church and would stay there rather than leaving for whatever reason, as is so often the case now. There were at least three reasons for this vibrancy. The first was the work of the Holy Spirit, for whose renewed work we are now praying. The second and third reasons were our message and our methods of discipleship. Our message doesn't change, nor should it, but rather grow as the Spirit leads. But how about our methods, how we conduct ourselves in ministry? Did Christ, through our pioneers, do things differently than we do them now? And might this account for the flatness of much of NAD Adventism? I say in large part, yes. In fact, I contend that a return in some form or other to certain key spirit-led practices employed in our pioneering days will not only enable the spirit to grab the attention and devotion of our current members, but will also enable the church to be ready for the outpouring of the spirit and by extension to finish the work that God has given her to do in North America and beyond. Now that is a bold, broad statement. Let's see if I can back it up. A word on methods. Methods are an outgrowth, or at least it should be, of our message and spirituality Proper methods will not bring a single person to Jesus. Someone say amen. amen. Okay? That is the job of the Holy Spirit, and may we never forget it. But improper, that is unspiritual and unbiblical methods, will most certainly choke off the Spirit's ability to work through Adventists to fulfill God's mission. Now, does that make sense? Amen. Well, I'm saying you can be devoted. You, you, can be, you can be someone that is devoted to the cause of Christ, but it is very clear that God is a God of order. If we work carelessly, haphazardly, we will not be as effective in God's kingdom because those ineffective methods, unbiblical, unspiritual methods, will choke off the blessing of the Spirit. Are we clear on that? Is that all right? Okay. Number one there, bad methodology does this in many ways, but the results of each of those ways as manifested in the modern NAD church are nearly always identical. Here it is. Spiritual responsibility for both personal growth and evangelism, that is, for discipleship, is taken away from individual members and given instead to religious figureheads. Note also that the 1920s and 30s seemed to mark out a definite turning point in the vitality and growth of the Adventist church in North America. In fact, these years are what have been referred to as the bummer years. Big, ugly, massive mistake. Something happened during that time frame that took us from being a passionate and rapid Christian movement to being spiritual boat anchors. This time in our history is so brief, yet so destructive, that it demands careful investigation. 
So let's get to it. What we left behind. From a purely methodological perspective, there are at least three major biblical practices that Adventism tossed out during the bummer years of the 20s and 30s. The combined effect of losing these three was a dramatic drop in discipleship activity. More about that later. The practices lost were these. Number one, church planting. Number two, employing non-settled pastors. And number three, well, I can't tell you everything today. You'll have to come back for that one. The following pages will show how the Spirit at one time used these first two practices to great effect in our church. Now listen closely here. Number three, page three, church planting and the non-settled pastor. When the SDA pioneers sat down in the late 1850s and early 1860s to hash out the church's method of ministry and organization, they turned to a single source for primary inspiration, the New Testament. What a novel idea. Let's start a church. Let's, ask, let's see what the Bible has to say. I think that's a great place to start. How, they asked, did the Spirit organize New Testament churches? How did the Spirit accomplish His mission through and with Christians? The answers to these questions led our pioneers to adopt, among other things, the central practice of church planting. Actually, to say the pioneers adopted church planting is misleading. They didn't adopt it. They lived it. And the reasons for this were obvious. Here's why. Church planting in the New Testament. There is no text in the New Testament which says, Thou shalt plant new churches. There is also no text in the New Testament which says, Thou shalt breathe. Point being, church planting was as natural as breathing in the New Testament. Whatever form of evangelism was used, church planting was nearly always an essential, even natural part of the picture. There's whole chapters that could be written on this, but the following should be sufficient to prove the point. If there were no church planting in the New Testament, fully one-third of the New Testament's books would be completely absent. Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. How come? Those were all plants, weren't they? If they never planted the church, there'd be nobody to write the letter to. Moreover, large portions of Acts, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, and Revelation would have to be cut out. Some people said, well, why Revelation? What's in Revelation 2 and 3? That's right. Paul, uh, Christ's letter to the seven church plants. That's what's in there. And of course, most of the Gospels, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and Jude, would have had no audience to be sent to in the first place. In short, without church planting, the New Testament would be a few pages long, and you and I might not be sitting here today. After all, the church we are members of was once a planted church too. In any previously unentered area, a new church is the natural outgrowth of people accepting Jesus as Lord. Pause for a moment, please. Church planting was the natural outgrowth of discipleship. It is normal for there to be a body of Christ. It is normal for when someone becomes a Christian for them to link up with other Christians that are also part of the body. It's just normal. We call that a church. Does that make sense? Okay, this is why church planting was just, it was part of what they did. It was natural. Number two, lessons on church planting and early Adventism. Though most people don't know it, up until the first two decades of the 1900s, the Adventist church was no different than the New Testament church when it came to church planting. Church planting was quite simply normal. Even when the first SDA camp meetings were being held, which were done completely for evangelism back then, the placing of new converts into existing churches was rarely done. New churches were formed with the new converts in new locations, and this on a regular basis. For instance, in the 1860s, basically our first decade of, of formal organization, we planted an average of how many? 360 new churches per year. That's almost one a day. In the 1870s, this is almost unbelievable, but I, I have checked this. This is correct. This number increased to 1,822 per year. <whistles> Compare this to the years between 1990 and 95, for instance, where we planted an average of 26. 1,822 to 26. Now, lest you be confused, some of you may have been present at our last uh, conference constituency session. And you may be remembering, and say, well, wait a second, we voted in nine or ten new church plants just in our conference. And sometimes, uh, uh, please, I highly respect our administrators, but I've heard many of them kind of complain when I mention this particular thing because they'll say, well, didn't you know, for instance, what happened in Texas? We had over a hundred churches planted in one year. And my response is, what ethnicity were they? Any guesses? Hispanic. 
Now, don't you dare walk out of here without understanding why I just mentioned that, okay? Praise the Lord for what he's doing amongst first-generation Hispanic church plants. Amen? Amen. We have one right over here. I mean, the meets in our elementary school. Uh, They're growing by leaps and bounds. Praise the Lord. Second-generation Hispanic church plants have American problems. They are usually not a part of that number. African-American churches and Anglo churches in this country, in this division, we're not doing so well. And most of the churches, in fact, for instance, Texas, where the thing was really touted, over 100, praise the Lord for those souls that came in. Almost all of them were Hispanic, though. In other words, the, the, whatever you, however you want to look at it, the, the people that have been in this country for a, for a long time, but more than one or two or three generations, it's flat. Millions upon millions of people. So let us continue with the tremendous movement among various ethnicities with church planting, and I think they would agree with us, hey, y'all come along with us. Let's do this together. But unfortunately, church planting is just eking its way through right now when it comes to more uh, numerically dominant population groups. This planting of new churches is the way the Spirit used to make Adventism the fastest growing denomination in the world at that time. Did you know that? During those years, the Adventist church was the fastest growing Protestant denomination that the world had ever seen. Church planting was so ingrained in early Adventism that you couldn't even be a pastor unless you first demonstrated you could plant a church. Witness the straightforward testimony of James White, Review and Herald, April 15, 1862. James, warm and cuddly guy that he was. Let's let's see what he has to say. Some who join the Seventh-day Adventists commence at once to preach to the brethren, many of whom are far in advance of them, and our brethren err in urging such to spend their time in preaching to them. Understand the situation. New convert comes in, becomes a Seventh-day Adventist. It shows that he has the gift of teaching and preaching. And some of the brethren in the Adventist church are saying, hey, listen, uh, practice with us. You know, preach to us here. James says, mistake. Let such ministers first be suitably instructed by those of experience in the message. Then let them go out into new fields, trusting God for help and success. And when they shall have raised up churches and shall have properly instructed them, then those churches will support them. This is before our current tithe system. If they cannot raise up churches and friends to sustain them, then certainly the cause of truth has no need of them. And they have the best reasons for concluding that they made a sad mistake when they thought that God called them to teach the third angel's message. Pastoral interviews back then were real short. I'd like to be a pastor. Have you planted a church? No. Next. (laughs) That was it. You had to prove that you could do it first, and then they might consider making you a minister. Now, fairly to the point, isn't he? Moreover, James, quote, hints at another of early Adventism's borrowings from the New Testament church, the absence of settled pastors. This is the TSPs. A settled pastor is roughly defined as one who stays with the church for long periods of time, today often three to seven years. This pastor generally does no church planting as all his or her time is consumed with the one existing church, preaching for it, chairing its various committees, visiting its sick, putting out its fires, etc. This is the way we usually do church today in North America, And if Ellen White saw it, she'd turn over in her grave. For Adventism was never intended to have settled pastors. Witness the following quotes from her and other church leaders of the past. Now, top of page five, the first quote there, number one, is from the Wabash, Indiana, Plain Dealer. The Plain Dealer was a newspaper back then. And there was a reporter that is interviewing G.B. Starr, who at that time was in the General Conference. Uh, the reporter's going to ask uh, Star some questions. And keep in mind, Adventism was a phenomenon back then and growing by leaps and bounds. And so people wanted to know, you know, what's, what's the deal, including this reporter. So he asks a question. The, the, the article's entitled, The Seventh-day Adventists, Some Facts and Figures Gathered from Elder Star, How They Have Grown in 40 Years and What They Believe. Question. By what means have you carried forward your work so rapidly? Answer. Well, in the first place, replied the elder, we have how many? No settled pastors. Our churches are taught to take care of themselves while nearly all of our ministers work as evangelists in new fields. In the winter, they go out into the churches, halls, or schoolhouse and raise up believers. In the summer, we use tents, pitching them in the cities and villages where we teach the people these doctrines. This year, we should run about 100 tents in this way. Then he goes on to describe how they do their ministry. What's the year that this was written? You see it there at the bottom? 1886. By 1886... Elder Starr here says 
We have no settled pastors. We have no pastors that are located over churches. They're out starting new churches. Look at quote number two. All Seventh-day Adventist clergymen, how many? All Seventh-day Adventist clergymen are missionaries, not located pastors, and are busy preaching, teaching, and organizing churches the world over. What's the date on that? 1909. Even past the turn of that century. In 1909, they're still saying, we don't have any settled pastors. Turn the page, please. Quote number four on page six. Ellen White concurs heartily with this church planting strategy. Number four there, this is from Christian Service, page 61. She says, as churches are established, it should be set before them that it is even from among them that men, and we would say also women, must be taken to carry the truth to others and raise up new churches. Therefore, they must all work and cultivate to the utmost the talents that God has given them and be training their minds to engage in the service of their master. Whose responsibility is it to plant new churches? It's everybody's, isn't it? She says everyone's supposed to cultivate this. Look at uh, number six on the next page, page seven. Review and Herald, 1889, May 7. They do not depend on the ministers to do all the work in your church and neighborhood. The pastors must seek the lost sheep and you must help them. And while the ministers are called to labor, where? In other parts of the vineyard, the people of God must have light in themselves, speaking to each other in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in our hearts and making melody unto the Lord. While you should respect the ministers highly for their work's sake, you must not trust them as your saviors, but build yourself up in the most holy faith. When you assemble in the house of God, tell your experiences and you will grow stronger. While you speak in meeting, you are gaining an education that will enable you to labor for others. I'll talk more about that later on. Now, by the late 1890s, and into the first part of the 1900s, there, became, there came this gradual call. Churches began to look around at some of the other denominations around them. They had settled pastors, and they said, listen, we would like to have one too. Could you send us a pastor? He doesn't have to stay with us all the time, maybe just half the year or something like that. This is Ellen White's response, number seven. This is from The Work in Greater New York, the Atlantic Union Gleaner, January 8, 1902. It says, there should not be a call to have settled pastors over our churches. But let the life-giving power of the truth impress the individual members to act, leading them to labor interestedly to carry on efficient missionary work in each locality as the hand of God, the church. Notice she didn't say the minister. As the hand of God, the church is to be educated and trained to do effective service. Its members are to be the Lord's devoted Christian workers. Now, as the debate began to grow, more people calling for settled pastors. One of the things that was often mentioned as a reason why they would like to have a settled pastor had to do with doctrinal purity, particularly when it came to sermons. They said, we need someone to come and to preach to us, to keep us on track, to tell us the truth, to remind us of the things that we were told about when this church was first started, back when it was planted. Please send us a settled pastor. Ellen White's response, Loma Linda Messages, page 179, quote number nine on your sheet. It has often been presented to me that there should be less sermonizing by ministers acting merely, wow, what a slap in the face, huh? All us TSPs. Acting merely as local pastors of churches and that greater personal efforts should be put forth. Our people should not be made to think that they need to listen to a sermon every Sabbath. Oh my. Many who listen frequently to sermons, even though the truth be preached in clear lines, learn but little. Ooh, now she's gone from preaching to meddling. And let me tell you, brothers and sisters, what Ellen White has just said is true. Let me tell you a little insight here, as someone on this side of the podium. She says there, many who listen frequently to sermons, even though the truth be preached in clear lines, learn but little. Now, this has nothing, of course, to do with anyone in this room, but at a church within 10,000 miles and within the last 20 years, uh, where I've done ministry previously, uh, this happened more than once. I would be preaching away on a sermon, and uh, uh, whatever the topic was, to be honest, I don't remember what the particular topic was in this particular instance. But I looked out, and as I'm nearing the end, I see someone sitting there in the congregation. And it dawns on me, you kind of got this, these two tracks going, you know, I'm preaching here, and then I'm also thinking, I thought, wow, 
I pray that this guy is listening. Because what I was talking about, I didn't plan this, but what I was talking about had to do specifically with a situation that I knew this guy was engaged in. Now, he didn't know that I knew. That's one of the occupational hazards of being a minister is that you often know too much. But there's this guy sitting there. I know, I thought, oh man, I hope, I hope he takes this to heart. Because frankly, he was being a royal pain and destructive, not just to himself, but to other people. So I meet him at the door. And he comes up, hand outstretched. And he says, Pastor, that was great. And I said, really? I said, well, praise the Lord. I'm glad you enjoyed Oh, yeah, man, right on, absolutely right. What a liar. He went out and kept doing the exact same stuff that he'd always done, happily. Now, you multiply that by a dozen times, and you get the picture. You see, here's the truth about preaching. If you go by the Bible, preaching is primarily for the unconvinced. You understand what I'm saying? Preaching is primarily a gift given for the unconvinced, not for those who already know the truth. Now please, I mean no offense by this. I like a good sermon. I get tired of listening to me, so if I get a Sabbath off or something, I'll go somewhere where I can pretty much be guaranteed I'm gonna hear a good sermon. Because I like to hear it too. There's nothing wrong with liking a good sermon. The problem comes when it becomes dependent on that good sermon. When there's a dependency upon it to help keep us fired up or impassioned or straight in line like these people are seeing. That's when it becomes idolatry. And so, the truth is you already know what I'm going to say most of the time anyway. You may not know how I'm going to say it. But you already know pretty much what I'm going to say. If you know that the topic, for instance, is the Sabbath, if I'm going to do a series on the Sabbath, you already know what I'm going to say. Uh, the Sabbath is from Friday sundown to Saturday sundown. Uh, it was not changed at the cross. It still remains the seventh day of the week. Uh, there are certain things that God asks us to do, certain things God asks us not to do. I might even get into the mark of the beast. You're probably certain about that because the Sabbath has something to do with that. In there. You already know what I'm going to say. And because we have settled pastors that are preaching to people who already know what we're going to say, most of homiletic courses, preaching courses, personal opinion here, just adjust the gospel according to Shane, most preaching courses that I have had contact with or have known people that have been in them teach you much more about style rather than content. Because after all, it's pretty hard to keep the attention of people who already know what you're going to say. Interesting, I don't know that the apostles were that concerned about that when they preached to those who had never heard the good news of Jesus before. It is not a sin to like a good sermon. It is a sin to be dependent upon it to keep you in line, to keep you impassioned. That's why Ellen White says our people should not expect to hear a sermon every Sabbath morning. She finishes with this sentence, often it would be more profitable if the Sabbath meetings were of the same nature as a Bible class study. We'll talk more about that later on. Ellen White defines the pastoral role as trainer-equipper when working with existing churches so that the people are trained and the pastor can repeatedly church plant. Top of page 8. Quote number 10, Testimonies for the Church, volume 7, page 20. She says, Let the ministers devote more, more of his time to educating than to preaching. Let him teach the people how to give others the knowledge they have received. Anybody know how long it takes to prepare a good sermon? I mean, how many hours? Okay, 10 to 20, 10 to 20 in there, usually closer to 20 depending upon, you know, whatever the, the topic might be in there. Now, if I was to take that just by hour, she's let the minister devote more, more of his time to educate, and that would mean that I could conceivably need to spend 21 hours each week educating if I'm going to spend that much time preaching, okay? Now, look at number 12, Gospel Workers, page 196. In laboring where there are already some in the faith, that would be here, the minister should at first seek not so much to convert unbelievers as to train the church members for acceptable cooperation. Okay? Look at number 13. Uh, don't read it yet, though, because a little background. One of the things that came up in the argument for settled pastors was that some of the churches were experiencing great divisions. Sometimes it was based around uh, relationships. So-and-so couldn't get along with so-and-so, and so there's this bickering going on. Sometimes uh, it was theological. 
Uh, there, was, there was great difficulty. Uh, some uh, influential elder would be taking the flock some way, another one would be taking them another way. And so they said, well, we need a pastor to come to teach and to preach and to set this thing straight. Number 13. God has not given his ministers the work of setting the churches right. No sooner is this work done, apparently, than it has to be done over again. And then she says something, which I don't know if I'd have the courage to say it, but this is what she says. She says, church members that are thus looked after and labored for become religious weaklings. All the guys are going, you know. How come? Why would a church thus looked after become, become a church of religious weaklings? It's because if you are expecting a, a, someone to come in and fix the problem for you, that means you don't have to. A the, theological problem. If a pastor comes in and says, okay, I've got it all down here, let me tell you what the answer is. Even if he's right, you have just missed the opportunity to flex your own spiritual muscles, to work out, to get into the word for yourself to figure out what's right and what's wrong. If it's a relational difficulty, you need the pastor there to take care of Matthew 18. He'll make sure that it happens right. Uh-uh, religious wimps. Strong religious people come when they say, I'm going to work through Matthew 18. I'm going to sweat the bullets and I'm going to go through the difficulty. I'm going to smile when I feel like choking the person because that's what God's asked me to do so we can love each other. Now you laugh. But when you relegate that kind of stuff to a pastor, you miss a workout that frankly you need to have. Churches that are thus looked after become religious weaklings. I shudder to think. I hope you do too. What would that mean after 70 or 80 years of doing church that way? You see, God knows who the real ministers in the church are. It's not me. It's us. And he expects us. He fully expects that we can call on his name and have the ability to do these things that so often we depend upon others to do. Middle of that quote there, if nine-tenths of the effort that has been put forth for those who know the truth have been put forth for those who have never heard the truth, how much greater would have been the advancement made? Number 15, Testimonies, volume 7, page 19. The greatest help that can be given our people is to teach them to work for God and to depend on Him, not on the ministers. Again, Testimonies, volume 7, 18 and 19. So long as church members... Make no effort to give others the help given them. Great spiritual feebleness must result. Look at page 9. The paragraph above uh, quote 18. Ellen White's reason for advocating this strategy for existing churches is obvious, and it's already been noted in studying her rationale for church planting. Clergy are to be free to plant churches rather than simply caring for existing Adventists. Now, a little background to uh, quotation 18. I have been speaking to you in glowing terms of the church that walked on water in Acts 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. And rightly so. It was amazing. It was normal. But it was amazing. Incredible things transpired there. But did you know that that early church that walked on water nearly sank to the bottom of the sea? Because they got stuck and they made a mistake and it almost killed them off. Acts of the Apostles, page 105. Forgetting that strength to resist evil is best gained by what? You want to overcome evil in your life? Aggressive service for Christ. That's where it's at. Forgetting that strength to resist evil is best gained by aggressive service, they begin to think. Who's they? The they is the apostles. The apostles in Jerusalem. They begin to think that they had no work so important as that of shielding the church in Jerusalem from the attacks of the enemy. Instead of educating the new converts to carry the gospel to those who had not heard it, they were in danger of taking a course that would lead all to be satisfied with what had been accomplished. To scatter his representatives abroad where they could work for others, God permitted, not sent, but permitted persecution to come upon them. Driven from Jerusalem, the believers went everywhere preaching the word. Wow, not a single amen. That's, that's pretty tragic. Uh, Let's see. Maybe you didn't understand. What I said was, is they went everywhere preaching the word of God. Every last one of them. They went out there and preached and they taught and they established churches. They scattered out from there now that they were out from under this potentially catastrophic TSP. Typical settled pastor. That church that walked on water almost sank. God saw it and he prevented it. 
I shudder to think that it would take machine guns in our faces for the modern Seventh-day Adventist church to make the same decision. Number 19, Christian Education, page 267. Those who would be overcomers must be drawn out of themselves and the only thing which will accomplish this great work is to become intensely interested in the salvation of others. Sounds a lot to me like Revelation 12 where it says that they, the saints, overcame him, the dragon, the devil, by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. Witnessing brings power to the witnesser not just the person who hears the words of the witness. We see then that one of Ellen White's primary reasons for wanting the church to adopt this pastor non-dependent model of ministry had to do with the spiritual nurture of, amazingly enough, existing Adventists. She envisioned a working church to be a healthy church and a pastor dependent church to be unhealthy. Now number 20, HMS Richards refers to this common understanding among early Adventist churches needing pastors as being in poor spiritual health. This is a quote from a book called Feed My Sheep. It's from 1958. And he's going to recall a story that he's heard from someone else here. I, I, don't, I think I've heard that this book is back in print. I hope that's true. Here's what uh, HMS says. He says, Then he went on to write about something which I suppose is hard for some of us today to understand and feel about as he did. 1958, okay? He mentioned what he called the, quote, unfortunate growing tendency in our denomination towards settled pastorates, unquote. The time of too many of our preachers, instead of being occupied with carrying the message into new fields, is taken up in settling church difficulties and laboring for men and women who should be towers of strength instead of subjects for labor. When I was baptized, this would have been back, I believe, in the 20s, Okay. When I was baptized and later became a young preacher, we looked upon churches that had to have settled pastors over every flock as being decadent. What's that mean? What's decadent? Okay, kind, of, kind of rich, satisfied, we were wealthy and increased in goods, this, this kind of self-satisfied thing. As being decadent, most of our preachers were out on the firing line, holding meetings, winning men to Christ, and raising up new churches. Then every few months they would come around and visit the churches that had already been established. This seemed to be, according to our view of it, the plan of the apostolic church. New Testament, right there. Now, you need to understand how serious the discussion became about settled pastors. Some churches literally began to die. Not just be divided, not just have disagreements about theology or whatever, but actually began to evaporate, I mean, to, to disappear. And some people said, you've got to send us a pastor. We're dying here. This was her response. Evangelism, page 381. The churches are dying, speaking of the, those, those few that were, and they want a minister to preach to them. They should be taught to bring a faithful tithe to God, that he may strengthen and bless them. They should be brought into working order, that the breath of God may come into them. They should be taught that unless they can stand alone, without a minister, they need to be converted anew and baptized anew. They need to be born again. Question. Is she saying that the spiritual need for a settled pastor is a salvation issue? Is that what she's saying? That is precisely what she is saying. Friends, listen to me. Baby churches need pastors. That's what they're for. Baby churches need apostles that will stay by them. Paul stayed with the church at Ephesus for over three years because they needed him. But friends, churches grow to maturity, at least healthy ones do. And for a mature, established church to have been established well, built upon Jesus Christ, to come back and to say, we must have a pastor to fix our problems. Ellen White says, no, what you need is reconversion because you have fallen away from the faith into paganism. You see, paganism is where people and things are held up as divine. Christianity is where Jesus Christ holds that position. And she says, if you need a pastor, if it is an established church, an established Christian, if you need a pastor, a settled pastor and support, 
in the spiritual realm. He says, if you've fallen away. You're depending upon a mere mortal. Put your trust in Jesus Christ. Fill the tank up again and get your robe on and be baptized again and come back up. Not my words. These are the words of the prophet. Quote number 22, lest you think this is uh, an isolated thought. Signs of the Times, January 27, 1890. This to me is an incredible quote, and when I first read it uh, years ago, it blew my mind because it is so far from where we currently are. But let's read it together here. The, The success of a church does not depend on the efforts and labor of the living preacher but it depends upon the piety of the individual members. What, what is piety? It's your commitment, isn't it? Your, 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 this high commitment to Christ, okay? It does not depend upon the efforts and labor of the living preacher, but it depends upon the piety of the individual members. When the members depend upon the minister as their source of power and efficiency, they will be utterly powerless. They will imbibe his impulses and be stimulated by his ideas, but when he leaves them, and by the way, in our system, we always leave. They will find themselves in a more hopeless condition than before they had his labors. And then she says this amazing quote, and if if she hadn't said it, I don't think I would have bought it, but here's what it is. I hope that none of the churches in our land will depend upon a minister for support in spiritual things. Good grief. Clearly she's crazy. Maybe by today's standards. Take, take that one-liner and, and uh, email it to your pastor back home. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what, it's, is she thinking clearly? It says, I hope that none of the churches in our land will depend upon a minister for support in spiritual things. That's what I'm for, isn't it? My experience again, just me. Anyone else feel free to contradict it. My experience in my training in the ministry is that almost all of it taught me to do precisely the thing that she says we are not to do. I was taught to become the person that people would spiritually lean upon. I took my personal ministry courses, which frankly had very little with your personal ministries. It had to do with my doing my own personal ministry to you, to to church members. That's what I was trained to do. We learn how to give, yes, Bible studies, which does have to do with evangelism, but most Bible studies are much better given by other people than the pastor. Because it gives more credence. You see, we're paid to do it. You're not. Believability, trust. But that's what they taught me to do. To visit the sick. To call on people. How to, you know, how to make a pastoral call. On. That's what they taught me to do. To be someone that you could lean on for support in spiritual things. And Ellen White has the gall to say, I hope that none of the churches in our land will depend upon a minister for support in spiritual things. You know what? I don't think it was gall that made her say that. I think it was the Spirit of God. And here's why she said it. She finishes that quote. She says, I hope that none of the churches in our land will depend upon a minister for support in spiritual things. Why? For this is dangerous. When God gives you light, you should praise him for it. If you extol the messenger, that is putting the pastor way up on the pedestal here, really, you know, if you extol the messenger, you will be left to barrenness of soul. Just as soon as the members of a church call for the labors of a certain minister and feel that he must remain with them, it is time that he was removed to another field that they may learn to exercise the ability which God has given them. Now you need to know something. I'm not trying to throw stones here or throw darts. I love my church. I wouldn't be here if that wasn't the case. But you need to understand that what we just read, that last sentence, is 180 degrees opposite from the way that we do things in North America and in most other portions of the world for that matter. Every church, regardless of size, when there is a pastoral, quotes, vacancy, I tend to refer to it as a pastoral blessing, but when there is a pastoral vacancy, the church gets together, the elders will meet, the board will meet, and say, we need a minister that can do this, this, and this. The conference comes. We sit down. We say, this is what we'd like to do. Do you have anybody that does that? Well, we have thus and so. The larger the church, the more active the process. By the time your church gets to be over 1,000 or 1,500 members, the process can take months. And they'll sit down with applicant after applicant. Can you serve us in this fashion? Can you serve us in this fashion? Can you serve us in this fashion? And finally, when the day comes and the vote is taken, at last this minister will remain with us and serve us. We found the man. 
And Ellen White says at that moment, that minister should be taken and put into another field. My guess is she would say where there are no Adventists so that he could preach and raise up a church. And that the members at that church would instead learn to do the ministry themselves. No one held up a sign and said, let's be jerks. Let's really mess things up. Let's call for pastors to settle over every church. Nobody did that. Okay, I'm, not, I'm not throwing stones here. In fact, most of the people that are involved in these pastoral search processes believe that they're doing it the way that it was always intended to be done. And I understand also, friends, that's how I got here. And let me just quickly add, I didn't come here because you asked me to. I didn't come here because Dave Wigley asked me to. I came here because God called me to be here. Y'all are nice people. Don't get me wrong. Please, don't misunderstand. I love you all. And I, th- I, I praise the Lord that you agree with God's calling that I ought to be here. Okay? But I wouldn't have come if it was just you. And I hope that if the shoe were on the other foot, that if I was the one calling you and it was just me, that you wouldn't come either. Ellen White says, don't depend upon the ministers. Well, as soon as one is called, you need to send them off. And she expands on this. Let's read. That's just a review. Just as soon as, a member, as the members of a church call for the labors of a certain minister and feel that he must remain with them, it is time that he was removed to another field that they may learn to exercise the ability which God has given them. Let the people go to work. Let them thank God for the encouragement they have received and then make it manifest that it has wrought in them a good work. Let each member of the church be a living, active agent for God, both in the church and out of it. We must all be educated to be independent, not helpless and useless. Let it be seen that Christ, not the minister, is the head of the church. The members of the body of Christ have a part to act, and they will not be accounted faithful unless they do act their part. Let a divine work be wrought in every soul until Christ shall behold his image reflected in his followers. Ooh. For those of you that are students of the spirit of prophecy, I hope a little light just went off in your head. What does that phrase remind you of? Until Christ shall behold his image reflected in his followers. Have you heard another quote like that somewhere? It says, when the character of Christ is what? In who? Then what happens? He will come. Could it be? Oh, I'm not even going to make it. Uh, uh, Maybe. It is true. The character of Christ being reflected in his people means that the minister's take up their ministry and do it. We have looked so much at that second statement when the character of Christ is perfectly reproduced and then he will come. We've looked so much at that as purely an internal matter. You know, it's just about my character. Well, sure, yeah, I mean, character development's always been part of Christianity. But could it be that what she's saying here, that this is a tie that she's saying, if you want to see the work finished, if you want to see the character of Christ reproduced, then get the clog out of the drain. And let the water flow freely freely where it needs to go. Let people do the ministry that God has asked them to do. Then the character of Christ will be reproduced in his spiritually strong and fit people. And then Jesus comes back. Hey, not a bad deal. Number 23, medical ministry, page 315. Upon all who believe, God has placed the burden of raising up churches for the express purpose of educating men and women to use their entrusted capabilities for the benefit of the world, employing the means he has lent for his glory. Notice that church planting is not simply for the unconvinced. Here she specifically says, it's for us. Who is it for? It's for the express purpose of educating those that they may entrust their capabilities for the benefit of the world so that disciples might become mature when they work for others. Turn the page, please. Quote number 27. Perhaps the most stunning quote of all concerning settled pastors and church planting comes from A.G. Daniels, who at the time he said the following was G.C. president. He and Ellen White were the last and strongest opponents to settled pastors. And though A.G. was not a prophet, it appears that at least for one moment he prophesied quite accurately. This is 1912, Los Angeles, California, Ministerial Institute Address. Quote, we have not settled our ministers over churches as pastors to any large extent. In some of the very large churches, we have elected pastors, but as a rule, we have held ourselves ready for field service, evangelistic work, 
and our brethren and sisters have held themselves ready to maintain their church services and carry forward their church work without settled pastors. And I hope this will never cease to be the order of affairs in this denomination. For when we cease our forward movement work and begin to settle over our churches, to stay by them and do their thinking and their praying and their work that is to be done, then our churches will begin to weaken and lose their life and spirit and become paralyzed and fossilized and work will be on a retreat. In 1915, Ellen White died. In 1920, A.G. Daniels was voted out of office. Within the decade, settled pastorates were well on their way to becoming the norm. And an amazing thing happened, or perhaps not so amazing when we stop and think about it. Our growth rate dropped sharply. That is, less and less people became disciples of Jesus through the Adventist church. No, we didn't stop growing, but our rate of growth declined drastically. Israel had gotten the king she so desperately wanted, indeed making her like the other denominations around her, which today are facing nearly mirror image decline. We adopted their ways of doing church, and now we have their problems. Today in the North American Division, we have over one million members. Praise the Lord. It is estimated that between 250,000 and 500,000 of those are active. And there are between one and two million former Seventh-day Adventists in the North American Division. Translation, there are more Adventists outside of the church than there are inside of it. If we were a business, we'd be broke. Some conclusions, and I direct your attention to the screen here. Wake up, wake up, the time is now. We'll do it the old-fashioned way. Some conclusions for you. The 1920s and 30s saw a catastrophic shift in the role of both the clergy and the church member. Some of you may wonder why have I spent so much time on the role of the pastor? It's because the two are inextricably intertwined. They go together. Let's make sure we understand what happened. Very quick review. Apostles in the New Testament. This is what it, what it needs to be. The apostles were the leaders of the work. In the New Testament, they were the ones responsible for establishing new churches. Elders, they led the local church. They were the primary teachers for and protectors of the church. They were the shepherds of the flock, equipping the saints for service, Ephesians 4, 11 to 13. The people of God, the new Jews, were all priests. They were all ministers of God. They performed the majority of the ministry in the kingdom of God, and they were the key players in Christ's New Testament church structure. But in the 1920s and 30s, when pastors began to settle over churches, things changed drastically. No longer were all of the people, the priests and the ministers, because now even the word minister came to mean... One person. No longer did they perform, the laity perform the, minister, the majority of the ministry in the kingdom of God. That was increasingly the pastor's job, not because he was an idiot, but because he thought that's what he was supposed to do. And no longer were the laity the key players in the kingdom of God because the pastor increasingly took the ministry that belonged to other people. And as a result, with the advent of the past settled pastors, the people of God had one job description, spectate. Elders no longer led the local church, that was the pastor. They were no longer the primary teachers for and protective of, that was the pastor's job. They were no longer the shepherds of the flock, the pastor was referred to as the shepherd. And so the pastor comes in and reduces elders to spectators. Calling for the offering on Sabbath morning is a good thing, but it's not a biblical role of an elder. And what about the apostles? Well, they were not the leaders of the work anymore uh, on the ground. Much of leadership was transferred into administrative roles, and, and again, many of them do a fine job. Establishing new churches, well, quite frankly, that doesn't happen very much. And the pastors came in there and reduced the apostolic role to extinction. Did you hear me? The apostolic role in the Seventh-day Adventist church and most every other church is dead. Small wonder that we have the difficulties that we do in this division and other places around the world. Conclusion number two. If we are to be a church that walks on water, we must reverse the bummer years and return to a biblical church structure. Amen. Number three, this does not mean that we should fire Pastor Shane and Van. I made a presentation similar to this uh, sometime back, 
And a guy stood up, and he was so excited. Fire y'all! Get rid of all of you! Sick of having you anyway! He was pretty excited about it. If you fired every pastor, if you sent every pastor out in the church planting right now, you know what would happen? Utter chaos, anarchy, terrible things would go wrong. A few churches would survive. Most probably would not. How come? Because to move to a New Testament structure by simply getting rid of the pastors is a foolish thing to do. There is training that must happen. There is, there, there, there is uh, discipleship. There are things that people must learn to do before a pastor could safely move off the scene in any, in any form in there. Some churches, and frankly I don't think you're one of them, but some churches reminds me of when you take the pacifier out of a baby's mouth. You know what happens when you do that? Ah! Usually in the form of, Mr. President, we need your help right now at the conference office, okay? Oh. Ellie, I was just kidding. This. <laughs> did you pull her pacifier out? Is that what you did? Yeah, okay, all right. I didn't teach her to do that. That's pretty good, though. Wow, that's right on test. So the solution is not to simply pull people up here. Rather, follow me closely now. The solution is to come as close to the ideal New Testament ministry structure as possible under our current constraints. This is very important. What I just read to you is the ideal. I believe it heart and soul, okay? If I was to be fired so I could go out to church plant, it wouldn't bother me a bit, okay? When God called me to be a minister, I was Jonah. I couldn't figure out for the life of me why in the world he would ask me to go and be a TSP. I couldn't. I, I mean, the idea of being, please, no offense to any minister in the room, okay, but this is my perception at the time. My perception was, is that to become a minister meant you never got your hands dirty, you never did anything that required work. Essentially, you were to become an effeminate baby kisser. Okay, now that's not correct. Okay, that's, that's not what it's supposed to be. But that was my perception. And I thought, oh Lord, why are you asking me to do this? I think I understand now why. And someday I'll share with you that story. So this would not concern me. If, if we were to, you know, if there was an environment where we could say, let's go back to what we just read right away. But we're not ready for that yet. There's some things that we need to do and we're going to do it wisely. We're going to do it only as quickly as is necessary. We're not going to run around and do stupid stuff, okay? I'm not leaving tomorrow. I'm probably not going to leave here for, for quite a while still, okay? All right? There still is going to be a sermon on Sabbath morning, all right? But that said, there are some things that must change if we are to find this ability to walk on water. Let me tell you just a little bit about what some of those things are. This should include at least the following. First of all, a simple but effective cycle of discipleship training for every New Market Church member. Right now, we have talked about, I'm not going to go back into it, when a person's baptized, usually that's it. We just kind of hope they fall into line somewhere in there. That's not going to cut it. We have some things that we can do very simply but are very effective that will involve everybody who's willing in helping to become a church of disciples, genuine mature disciples of Christ. That's coming and probably in another month, four or five weeks, I'm going to share with you some of the specifics of that. Sorry to be so vague at the moment, but we'll get back to that. Number two, we need to plant a church. Amen. And the four of you that said amen, we'll all go out there together. That's... <laughs> Now, we're not ready to do this tomorrow, but I'll tell you what, good news, the New Market Seventh-day Adventist Church is pregnant. We're also overdue. All right, people are starting to think there's triplets or quadruplets in this mother, okay? We need to be about the Lord's business. Church planting is to be normal for a church that walks on water. Seventh-day Adventist churches, by definition, are people who plant churches and start new ones. Now, I will confess to you, we have a little bit of a handicap here in that we have the city church in the country. Do okay, you understand what I'm saying? We don't have 150,000 people right next door that we can go and, 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 as Jesus said, put the hooks in the water and catch men, okay? So some things are going to be a little bit different out here than it would normally in a metro environment. But don't think for a moment that there aren't church planting opportunities well within our reach here. Oh, my goodness. There are some tremendous opportunities where I think the Spirit just salivates and says, oh, I hope they do this. I hope they do this. That day's coming. 
We need to organize ourselves to disciple one another and to care for one another. Now last week, somebody, as I, I put up on the screen, said uh, that one of my jobs is to keep my wife happy as a pastor. That is true. That is true. And I fully accept that. And there's a good reason why I married who I did. Uh, she's a great cook, by the way. That fudge thing, that was a total anomaly. That doesn't happen very often. Okay. She said, you need to be sure at this point in today's sermon right here that you let people know something about care. Good point. So here's what you need to know. Some people right now may be feeling very uneasy because of what I just read about what the true role of a pastor is and that settled pastors are, are, are out, verboten. You might be thinking, well, man, I don't get cared for very well now. You know, I get a call probably, oh, I don't know, not a whole lot, maybe once every three weeks of somebody with varying degrees of niceness complaining about people that have fallen through the cracks. No one ever visited so-and-so. Don't you know that they've been sick for so long and so-and-so comes to church but nobody even knows it. It's like they're invisible. Pastor, I want you to do something about that. All right? I will. Did you know that settled pastoring has huge holes in it? when it comes to, quotes, pastoral care. Big enough you can drive a couple semis through. It is estimated that the average person can give adequate spiritual care and nurture to 10 people. Last I checked, there were 743 people on the books of this church. That means if Pastor Van and I hear that I get, what is that, 300 and, help me with the math, people, and he gets the other 300 in there, well, we'll take care of it. Now that's overstating the case, I understand. But you see the problem. You need to know beyond the shadow of a doubt that a New Testament structure will care for you better than anything else. God knows what he's doing. In fact, did you know? Did you know that the New Testament church and the early Adventist church for the first 60, 70, actually even a little bit longer, up to 80, 90 years of the Adventist church, they did something. They did something that enabled them to care for the believers in their church, to not only disciple people from, you know, from birth in Christ to maturity in Christ, to being a missionary for him, but also to care for one another. When crisis came, when things got difficult, when somebody got sick, they did something that was incredible. It made them phenomenally effective at serving the needs of other people. And I'm going to tell you all about it next week. But until then, I want to challenge you with something. Did you know that there is a distinct Adventist advantage when it comes to what I've just presented to you? You see, some churches have not had the advantage of the history that we do. It is part of the Adventist DNA, if you will. I mean, we're mavericks. <laughs> I mean, we're pioneers to become an Adventist. I mean, to, to, to become baptized, to join the Seventh-day Adventist Church, you've got to be a little bit out there. I mean, you've got to be on the edge, moving out there, crossing faith, because of what Adventism, te it, it tends to cut across what is commonly thought to be appropriate or true. You've got to have that pioneering spirit. You know where that comes from? It comes from our roots. We have the distinct Adventist advantage of not having to wonder, what would it be like to be a church that walks on water? We can look back and say, you know what? They did it. They weren't all perfect, they had their difficulties, but they did it. They grew by leaps and bounds. They did what it was that God asked them to do. And I'll tell you what, if we are willing to go back and do as much as we can what they did, to recreate the good news of the New Testament in our churches, we can become a normal Seventh-day Adventist church that walks on water. I'll see you next week. Let us pray. Christ, you are indeed the captain of this throng. This is your church. These are your people. We are all your ministers. Lord, we pray for the infilling of your Holy Spirit, that we might have the courage to do the task that you've placed before us, Lord. I pray for each person here, Lord, that you would invigorate them, that you would give them your passion, and that they would carry out the ministry, Lord, that you have blessed them with the ability to do. This is our prayer, in Jesus' name.